Right now. <laughs> yeah, very good. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, so it will be recorded, but about the availability, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, maybe uh, if you will uh, uh, write to us that you want to have or to watch the video. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, so you can uh, write later and maybe we can provide a link for the video. Uh, yes. So, um, well, uh, without further ado, I will let you with uh, Leticia Vitral and, and her presentation. Uh, oh, the email address. Yes, uh, uh, it's uh, semiosalong.gmail.com. Uh, it is also on the page. So, uh, yeah, you can, you can write there for any other question you, you, you have. So, now I will leave you with Leticia and her presentation. Uh, yes, no stem semiotica, semiotics in Brazil. So, uh, thank you. Okay, hi. Uh, let me just first put the presentation here for you guys to, to see and then... Um... Is it working? Can you see the, the sharing screen? Okay. So, hi, thanks very much for, for joining uh, our first session about semiotics in Latin America. Uh, my name is Leticia Vitral, and uh, I am uh, a PhD student from the Linnaeus University in Sweden. I'm currently finishing my PhD, and yes, I'm from Brazil. And uh, I did uh, my bachelor and my master's in Brazil on, uh, on semiotics, on arts and semiotics. So. I've been in the in the field of semiotics related to the Brazilian culture since the beginning of my uh, academic life, and today we're going to talk a little bit about that because yes, no stem semiotic. So let's start uh, by understanding a little bit about Brazil. So here we are in the world, occupying almost one fourth of the territorial area of the whole Latin America, and this is an important feature as we are going to see later. Uh, we are the fifth biggest country in the world and the sixtieth most populated one, uh, with a population of around 211 million Brazilians living inside the country. But as you can see, there are some that are outside the country, so this number is even higher. Uh, and as we can see from this painting from one of our main painters, who we're going to talk about later, uh, Tassilo do Amaral, uh, we are a highly miscegenated folk. Uh, our, our population is pretty much described as a melting pot with different cultures coexisting inside the same country and sharing different influences among uh, themselves. Um, as you can see, uh, of course, those influences and those different uh, backgrounds, they are not shared in a homogeneous way along the country. Uh, we have some parts of the country that are more populated by people from the originary American ancestry, more people from African ancestry, people from European ancestry and also Asian ancestry. As we can see from this graph from our, uh, it's a graph from the Brazilian official, like part of the government who does graphs and numbers and things. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, our population uh, of, of, of immigrants, they come from different places of the world. They come from Asia, they come from their own Latin America, they come from Europe, and they also come from the African continent that unfortunately it's written in this graph as other countries of origin because Brazil was the last country in the whole American continent to abolish slavery. So we don't have a very clear records of which countries were those people coming from, unfortunately. Uh, but our country is very homogeneous in terms, very heterogeneous in terms of population, also when it comes to the distribution of them, as you can see here uh, in this graph. We have our four main cities here in yellow, the city of Sao Paulo in the bottom, the city of Rio right next to it, the city of Belo Horizonte above it, and the city of Salvador even more on top. Those are the four main cities in Brazil. And I know nobody asked it, but I don't care. I come from here. Uh, nevertheless, uh, what do you think by taking a look at this graph and seeing how our population is distributed? What does it mean? Like, what are some consequences of it? Well, I'm going to ask my own, uh, answer my own question. I'm going to say that one of the consequences that we can have is that it's very hard for us to reach places and people inside the country. I live close to Rio and I've never been to my capital and I know many Brazilians who haven't either. Um, and also another consequence that we can have 
excuse me, just for you guys to take an, uh, have an idea of how far things are inside Brazil, the distance between our two main cities, which are the cities of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, it's like 100 kilometers more than the distance between Tartu, where I am right now, and St. Petersburg. Uh, and as I was going to say, uh, another consequence that we have from this uh, population of distribution is that we are mostly concentrated on the coast, which means that we have very little contact with the rest of the continent when you compare to how other countries in Latin America are connected among themselves. And this distance that we have from the rest of Latin America, uh, it's not only in geographic and demographic terms, but it also comes because the people that arrived in Brazil uh, uh, in 1500 weren't the Spanish people. Uh, so yeah, we are far from these other Latin American folks here, not only when it comes to distance, but also in terms of language and culture. So you might be asking at this point, okay, but what does it have to do with the presentation about semiotics, right? Well, uh, you can see that first, just to try to connect the dots, we developed in a relatively independent and isolated way from the rest of the continent when it comes to the, to, to, to the tradition of semiotics. But also we developed in a relatively independent and isolated way inside the own country. And this development happened on the basis of a highly multicultural background with different tendencies and mechanisms in different regions of the country. There are some pros and cons to it, of course. Some of the pros is that it's, some of the cons is that it's hard to trace strong and equivalent parallels with the development of the field in the rest of the continent. Also, the Spanish translations were not highly and easily available for us because Portuguese speakers, they can understand the Spanish language pretty well. The reciproc is not true, but we can understand Spanish very well. Nevertheless, they were not very uh, easily available for us. Uh, some hubs of research also, they had few contacts with the other. People that were like working with something on Sao Paulo didn't have much contact with people that were working in similar things maybe in Salvador because of the distance. But of course, there are some as well. As for example, we have a very unique development in relation to the rest of the continent. Uh, the lack of translations that I mentioned led to our own translations, interpretations and developments. And the hubs of research, they were developing inside their own cultural and social constraints. And as we saw uh, in the presentation, that it's very heterogeneous due to the different influences and cultures that were predominant in the areas, which resulted in a very diverse productions and environments of research. So my presentation, this was kind of the introduction, uh, my presentation is going to be divided in two parts, one boring one and one nice one. The boring one, I'm going to talk more about the development of semiotics as an academic discipline in Brazil. And the other part, I'm going to talk about the Tropicalian movement uh, and uh, everything that is around it, because uh, the Tropicalian movement is a very good example of how the play with science, with language and with culture in a very structured way, it's part of Brazilian culture in the last, uh, in the last century and since the Tropicalian movement so on. So let's start uh, first by talking about the development of semiotics as an academic discipline in Brazil. So it all started in the 1960s, and I know that many of you would like to believe that Brazil looked like that at the time, but actually it was something more like that. Uh, we were going through some of the most turbulent and violent years of the military dictatorship we had. Uh, academians, researchers, general professors from all levels, artists, and people involved in the cultural. Um, sphere, they were under a strict law of censorship called the Institutional Act Number no. 5. So with that in mind, few people could come and present new ideas inside the country from their own country. And uh, bearing this situation, a number of academians from around the world were being invited to lecture in Brazil, since by being foreigners, they were uh, subjected to a bit more freedom of speech, so to say, than our own academians. Among them, uh, were Nicolas Rouvet, the French linguist, the French uh, scholar on information science and communication studies, Abraham Moles, the one and only Roman Jakobson, uh, the German logician, aesthetician, and semiotician Max Benz, the Italian superstar uh, Umberto Eco, and the Bulgarian linguist Todorov. All of them, there did a series of lectures, mostly in the city of Sao Paulo at that time. And of course, those lectures that were done along uh, the, the decade of the 60s, they left some seeds here and there that were mostly uh, uh, 
how do you say, like not, not planted, but groomed. I don't know if you can use groomed for seeds, but I think we got planted by those two guys here, Desio Pinatari and Haroldo de Campos. As we're going to see along the presentation, those guys are going to come up pretty often because they are our main names of, uh, of semiotics when it comes to, to, to the beginning mm -hmm. of it and to the establishment of it in the country. Um, so already in the 70s, as like the, the repercussion of those series, series of lectures that we had in the country, those dudes started writing and publishing about semiotics, but most specifically about Persian semiotics. Uh, and this is why the work of these two guys is the reason why the scholarship of Perse in Brazil is one of the strongest ones in the whole continent. And it also explains why some fields like arts, uh, literary studies, cultural studies and communication are more connected to Persian semiotics than to structuralist semiotics as it normally is in other countries. Uh, since these two guys were artists, poets and translators themselves. And another reason for the Persian tradition to be so strong in Brazil, it has to do with the fact that in 1971, uh, a book from uh, Roman Jakobson was translated to Brazil. It's a book that it's actually a compilation of writings that according to Lucia Santaella, a very important Brazilian semiotician, there were no Brazilian student and researcher from the field of humanities then that then did not have this book always at hand to discuss with the colleagues. And in this book, it's one of the articles that are in this book is the question of the essence of language, which is uh, basically a nod to Peirce, even though he also mentions Saussure. But in this article, uh, Jacobs, yeah, Jacobson introduces the new list of categories. He explains the basic trichotomy of icon, index, and symbol. He goes even a bit further talking about images and diagrams, and he describes Peirce as the most inventive and versatile among American thinkers. So, of course, this had an effect on the scholarship at the time. And when it comes back to our two pioneers, uh, Desio Pinatari and Arudo de Campos, uh, they started teaching uh, in the Department of Communication of the University of Sao Paulo, which is the biggest university in Latin America. And in 1978, they founded the program on communication and semiotics, which had the focus on Persian theory applied to the arts, music, architecture, literature, and mass communication. Uh, in the decade of the 70s also, it started to emerge some translations origina uh, originating from, uh, from, from Peirce's writing. In 1971, there were some chosen uh, texts from Peirce, uh, manuscripts that were published. In 1974, some excerpts from the, from the collected papers were also published. And in 1978, another book with some writings from from Peirce Republic. And this book from 78 was like a very famous book. I, basically every scholar at the time that was working somehow with the humanities had this book in their library. I remember my grandpa who studied the law, he had this book in the library and it took me a long time to understand what it was about. Uh, so during the 80s, because of those translations, uh, dozens of dissertations based on semiotics were defended in Brazil, mostly in the University of Sao Paulo, when under the watch of uh, Desio Pinatari and Haroldo de Campos. And among their students was lady here, Lucia Santaella, who nowadays is one of our main semioticians. As we can see by this nice beauty, uh, this nice uh, poster that we have in our department that Oscar is also going to show in his presentation, uh, Santaella is not only one of the only two women that are in this poster, but it's also the only Latin American that is in this poster. So that says a lot. Uh, in 1996, uh, the international, uh, she founded the International Center for Persian Studies in the Catholic University of Sao Paulo, which is also a very big and important university in Sao Paulo, where they organized conferences, they organized meetings, they organized, they, they, had a, they have a, a, a publication, uh, and they research mostly matters of theoretical semiotics, semiotics and interdisciplinary studies, and specific semiotics, like, for example, semiotics of media, semiotics of uh, movies, semiotics of something like that. And one of her students, uh, and probably one of the most important Persian names in Brazil after her nowadays, is Professor uh, João Queiroz, uh, who uh, is, uh, was my supervisor during my bachelor and during my master's, and is my co-supervisor now uh, on my PhD. In 2016, he founded the Iconicity Research Group in the Federal University of Juiz de Fora, which is my hometown. And you can access our work. You can see the works that we are developing. Currently, we are having a series of lectures online as well that started yesterday. You can just check, check in this link. 
We are basically an interdisciplinary group dedicated to the investigation of iconic processes in art, science, philosophy, and literature. Uh, those are some of the works that we are currently uh, exploring, and you can see that all of them converge somehow on matters of intersemiotic translation, creativity, literature, poetry, philosophy, and art in general. And also, if you're a Persian scholar, you probably, probably at some time needed the help from the Commons Encyclopedia of Pers Pers Studies. Well, our research group is one of the, the, the people from our research group are one of the people behind it. So if you ever use Commons, thank Brazil for that. Um, about the structuralist uh, um, a tradition, it's a relatively strong in Brazil as well, mostly based on Grima, not as much on Sessu, but I won't talk much about it because honestly speaking, I'm not very close to it. I'm more from the Persian tradition, but it is still a very interesting one. And I'm going to show at the end of this presentation some uh, resources that you can find information about. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about cultural semiotics since we are here in Tartu, right? Where it, uh, it uh, really got its grip. And uh, cultural semiotics in Brazil, even though as we're going to see, uh, some seeds were already planted earlier, already uh, only got strong in the country during the, the, 90, uh, the, the 90s uh, decade. Uh, and the reasons are actually pretty obvious. As we said, we were going through a very strong di dictatorship that was backed up by the United States. So everything that was basically coming from like uh, Eastern Europe was seen like, oh my God, communist stuff. It's definitely not the kind of thing that you wanted to have with you when a policeman walked around, even though it has nothing to do with communism whatsoever not a good idea unless you want to be killed and tortured, but I think that's not the case. And also in 1990s, as we know, uh, here in Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union was over. So after this decade, uh, the texts and the productions that were constructed and created here in this area, they started to be vehiculated around the world much more. And in the 90s, this lady here, Irene Machado, who is also from the Catholic University from Sao Paulo, uh, the work, free, especially from Lotman, uh, became very strong in Brazil. She commanded several research groups in the last years about Russian semiotics, the applications of the concept of semiosphere, and formalist semiotics in general. According to her, Brazilian culture serves as a field for applying semiotic theses that were born in the Slavic culture context, and not only in the approach of the European semiology and social semiotics as it's usually publicized. Uh, her works, uh, they, they surround more issues of multiculturalism, bearing analysis of film, media, television. Uh, but as I'm going to briefly show now, the, despite this very strong uh, um, development in the 90s, the entrance in the country was also kind of similar, even though in a much lesser scale due to the, to the political context that I already explained to the Persian tradition. And it had to do also with the fact that works from Roman Jakobson, Mikhail Bakhtin, Yuri Lotman, uh, Ivanov, and Boris Schneiderman were being vehiculated to the country, mostly due to dialogue, written correspondence, and translations made between the works of them and between them, in the case of correspondences, and, surprise, surprise, Katsupi Atari and Arodich Kops. Uh, up to the point that when uh, in a book that Schneiderman is talking about Jakobson, he actually mentions the way that Arodo de Campos uh, describes Jakobson as the poet of linguistics. So the works that were being developed by Pinatari and de Campos, uh, based on the works of those people, they were being started to be used as references. Uh, if you are more interested in, uh, in the developments of uh, cultural semiotics, in Brazil and Latimanian semiotics. You can take a look at this article uh, that I'm showing here because it's uh, open access at the, the journal of the department here in Tartu, Science System Studies. You, just, you can just Google that and you will find this article uh, with open access where you can read more about it. So now let's go to the fun part, in which I'm going to talk about our two colors, semiotics as a cultural feature in Brazil. So in order to start, let's recall the fact that the Portuguese people arrived in Brazil in the year of 1500, which is a very good choice this year because all Brazilian students, because it's so easy to count how old our country is in terms of colonization. It's a round number, thank you for that, but only for that. 
so yeah, they arrived in Portuguese in Brazil in the 1500, and that's actually kind of an embarrassment because they were actually aiming to reach India. But they messed it up like big time because they went literally to the opposite side of the world and then found Brazil. And um, since they got the place wrong, it's not what they were looking for. In the beginning, they kind of didn't care much about what they just found. But of course, at it, I mean, this was the thing that Europeans were into at that time. They came and claimed it land theirs and then just went back. And uh, they kept sending uh, uh, people to Brazil during the following centuries, but in very small amounts, because we were a colony of exploration and not a colony of settlement, like, for example, the US. So the Portuguese people, they were settling in Brazil very slowly in order to explore our cultural resources, not to settle in the country per se. Um, so around 1700, it's when the, the process of urbanization in Brazil started to, 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 get, more, to get stronger and to get uh, more important. As we can see, for example, in this, uh, the, the colonial cities that we have in the state of Minas Gerais, like the city of Ouro Preto that is shown here. So yeah, 1700. What was the artistic trend that was in vogue at the time in Europe? It was somehow the Baroque. So the Baroque movement was the first artistic trend, trend to happen in Brazil, especially in the colonial cities, and especially due to the fact that those colonial cities, mainly in the state of Minas Gerais, they were full with gold. The state of Minas Gerais can be literally translated to general mines. So yeah, pretty obvious here. So this was actually very interesting because the first uh, ar ar artistic expression that was uh, uh, going on in Brazil was actually acquired some local colors, like Brazilian Baroque is very different from European Baroque. It's not like just trying to do European Baroque, but with Brazilian thematics or something like that. No, it's very different in all its aspects. But nevertheless, in terms of uh, artistic production, after the Brazilian Baroque, our art was pretty much a mimesis of uh, European trends, up to the point that in the uh, 19th century, the center of the city of Rio de Janeiro was dem demolished to be reconstructed in order to look like Paris. Like it was explicitly stated that it should look like Paris. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that the art that was produced in this period is bad or irrelevant, of course not. But in terms of, of novelty in artistic production, we were basically taking European trends and dressing them up with Brazilian thematics, like Indianism and this kind of thing. And as you can see, even the, the Indian, the, the originary people that were being represented, they were kind of white. So not a very good thing. But uh, 100 years after our declaration of independence, in the year of 1922, things started to change mostly due to the week of modern art that happened in Sao Paulo in 1922. Uh, as we call it in Brazil, simply the week of 22, which was uh, 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 a week, like as I said, it's a week, so it was several days that there were exhibitions, that there were performances, that there were like musical concerts being made, all bearing uh, the idea, all, all uh, concerned with the idea of introducing new ideas in Brazilian art bearing modernism in Europe. However, they, were, they had a very strong intent to build something that was Brazilian in nature. So it was a sort of nationalism, but it was not traditional and it was not conservative. And this is due to the colonial forces that were in play. Uh, some of the main names that, uh, that uh, uh, participated in this, uh, in this week are the painters Anita Malfatti, Di Cavalcanti and Tarsila do Amaral. Tarsila do Amaral has like this little star in the name because actually she was not present in the week of 22 because she was outside Brazil, but she was a core member of the group. And she was the one who painted this painting, the beginning of the presentation with those lot of different faces. It's from her. Uh, we had the sculptor, uh, Bricheret. We had the writers, Mario de Andrade, Oswald de Andrade and Príncipe Salgado, and the musician, Vila Lobos, among others. From this group, some kept on with their artistic investigations, like those, and some had like a very interesting development, like this who kind of became a Brazilian Nazi and tried the coup and then got arrested, which is something completely nonsense. Like Nazism is only completely nonsense by itself, but Brazilian Nazism is like another level of nonsense. Nevertheless, uh, we had those, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we had those two here. 
Oso de Andrade and Tarsilo do Amaral. They were actually a couple, and after the week of 22, they kept working on the developments of several ideas that started to be planted on that week, especially the rejection towards conservative views on art and culture, the rejection toward rules in art, and they were aiming for a closer connection to Brazilian popular art and the creation, of course, of a genuine Brazilian artistic product. So now is when things start to get interesting. Uh, some years later, they started what is called the anthropophagic movement. As you can see by the name, anthropophagic, it's sometimes translated in English as the cannibalist movement. But don't worry, they weren't going around telling people to eat each other. That's not nice. Even us know that. Uh, what it really meant, as it was uh, shown in the anthropophagic manifest that they published in the anthropophagic magazine uh, that was written by, by Oswald de Andrade and it was illustrated by Tarsila Damaral. Actually, just a parenthesis, this illustration from, uh, from Tarsila, it's actually uh, one of our most famous and most important paintings and also one of the reasons uh, for the biggest wounds in Brazilian egos, because this painting is exhibited in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. It doesn't belong to us. But nevertheless, this painting is called U Abaporu which means in a, in a originary language, the man eater, not the Nelly Furtado one. But you can see that it has uh, connections with the whole idea of uh, man eating, cannibalism and anthropophagy. So now I'm going to show some, uh, some excerpts from this, uh, from this manifest. And I want you guys, and you guys, <laughs> to think uh, about how does it relate to semiotics? How can that be a connection to semiotics anyways? So let's go. So, cannibalism alone unites us, socially, economically, philosophically. To pee or not to pee, that is the question. To pee is actually both a, a linguistic group as well as a, a group of tribes that were originary from Brazil. Uh, I am only concerned with what is not mine. Law of the man, law of the cannibal. Down with all the importers of canid consciousness. Cannibalism, absorption of the sacred enemy, to transform him into a totem, the human adventure, the earthly goal. But those who came here weren't crusaders, they were fugitives from a civilization we are eating because we are strong and vindictive, like the Jabuti. Jabuti is like a big uh, Brazilian tortoise. So, what do you guys think is going on here semiotically? Well, I'm going to spoil the answer. This here is pretty much a semiotic theory of translation of culture. It's described in terms of the urgency to ingest the colonizer's cultures, digest them in the colonized body, and puke something that is not recognizable as what was eaten because the body processed it, but as something novel. So at this point, you might be thinking, what is the difference here besides the use of like this allegory and fancy words uh, to describe a process of translation from source to target? Well, I'm going to let Arnold Kamps answer that. According to him, Oswald's anthropophagy is the thought of critical devoration of the universal cultural heritage. Formulated not from the insipid, resigned perspective of the noble savage, as he talks here about the Brazilian romanticism that was going on in those, those centuries that I mentioned about that were pretty much mimetizing uh, European culture. Uh, but from the point of view of the bad savage, the devourer of whites, the cannibal, whites here as a metaphor to, colonize, uh, to the uh, people that were colonizer. Uh, the latter view does not involve a submission, an indoctrination, but a transculturation, or better, a transvalorization a critical view of history as a negative function, capable of appropriation and of expropriation, de-hierarchization, deconstruction. Any past which is an other for us deserves to be eaten, devoured. So this is where the idea of uh, anthropophagy, of uh, cannibalism comes being important because it's not a theory of destruction. Right? Uh, they are not saying that we should forget, ignore, or even literally destroy any source of cultural input from the colonizers. It is a theory of eating, digesting, and puking. The puke is the destroyed cultural input uh, of the colonizers when it comes to the morphology of it, to say, like, 
If you eat a, a piece of meat and then you puke, of course, two things, they look different, right? But somehow they still share some qualities in common. Uh, so it was processed through digestion. It was destroyed through digestion, but it was not eliminated. In other words, a uh, true Brazilian cultural project should not rejoice and ignore the colonization power forces. It should subvert them using our own means to claim them to ourselves. So here, according to anthropology, the translation from cultures, they are not just translations, they are creations, they involve a process of creation. And they go even further and they develop, like Harold de Campos developed the terminology of a trans creation. Uh, so trans creation, there is this very nice book from him, from Harold de Campos, that uh, I, don't, I, I couldn't find that translated to English, but nevertheless, it's available on academia.edu if you guys want to read that in Portuguese, which is called From Transcreation, Poetics and Semiotics of the Translative Operation. And this book, he talks about this process of transcreation, which is pretty much an approach of translation as an investigative experimental process of creation. So that being said, those ideas that were being vehiculated in the 20s and then they started to get uh, stronger and stronger with the passing of time, they found their true home in the 60s, the movement. So I'm calling it here a movement, but it was something more like a general trend. Since it was not organized, like it was not a group of people that were like, oh, let's make this movement like the surrealist group was or something like that. As we saw, Brazil is very big. That were, there were people from different parts of the country, from the Northeast and Southeast and so on. So it was very hard to call it an organized movement. If you look in the internet, you're probably going to find the Tropicalia Manifesto. That was not written by them, but it was appropriated by them. So you can see that it was not a, a, very, a very organized in terms of cohesive uh, uh, participation of members. But nevertheless, it was a very general trend that was going on in Brazilian uh, cultural sphere at the time in the second half of the 60s. So this is the core group, like the people that are mostly remembered about when we talk about Tropicalia. Uh, and in this photo, they're here in this photo, and they are mainly musicians, songwriters, composers, and like orchestra, how do you call it, like con conductor or orchestra conductor. Uh, and they were mostly from the northeastern state of Bahia, where the city of Salvador is, that I showed in the beginning of the presentation, and from the city of Sao Paulo in the southeast. But there were also, of course, interlocutors with them in different areas, not only music. So this, for example, uh, the, um, the artist uh, Elio Sica, which is one of our most important artists as well, and he had even a full retrospective made by the Tate Museum in 2007. You can find information about that online. Actually, Oichisika is the one that came up with the name Tropicalia, which is the name of this, uh, um, um, how do you call it, like participative installation, interactive installation that is called Tropicalia from him. But nevertheless, he was not part of that core group. Their core group was composed by, the, uh, by Gilberto Gil, who later during our Lula years was our Minister of Culture. Caetano uh, Veloso, also a singer, the rock band Os Mutantes, uh, that was composed by Rita Lee, Arnaldo Batista, and Sergio Dias, the musician Tom Zé, the singer Cal Costa, the orchestra conductor Rogério Duprá, uh, Nara Leon, the singer that actually she came from the Bossa Nova movement, but the Tropicalia group, and the poets Tocato Neto and Capinã. So let's remember, as I said here, that uh, this was pretty much the situation of Brazil at the time in the 60s. We were under a dictatorship backed up, backed up by the United States. So basically everything that was coming from the United States was seen by the cultural and intellectual elites from Brazil as something not good, as something like a sign of imperialism, a sign of a neo-colonialism, a sign of these people that are oppressing us with this dictatorship and so on and so forth. So it was there were like some struggles going on in the cultural scenario due to that, which culminated in 1967 with the march against the electric guitar, which like today is extremely funny, but yeah, it happened. Uh, in which people from a, a genre, a Brazilian musical genre that we call Brazilian popular music, but it's not popular in the term of folk. 
it's popular in the term of like uh, samba, Brazilian rhythms, and and this kind of thing. So it it it, it it's still elitized. It's not folkish. But nevertheless, they got together and they even dragged some members of the Tropicalia movement who had kind of to do that for the sake of contacts and records and this kind of things. So this was like the environment, the cultural environment of Brazil at the time, especially in the cities of Rio and Sao Paulo. So we were kind of struggling in terms of culture and politics all together. But of course, this march against the electric guitar was kind of like not a success. And a lot of people found that this was pretty much big BS. And one of the main group of people that thought that were of course scientists. And the reason for that is that they hold very close the modernist ideals of anthropophagy. And, can, and these ideals, this choice of that they made, can be seen also by the choice of the name, Tropicalia, which is actually a name from the sculpture from uh, Oichisika, uh, that Tropicalia uh, brings us the ideas of the images of Brazil as a tropical paradise that can be found since the first written uh, uh, excerpt about Brazil ever, which was the letter that Pedro Vaz de Caminha wrote to the King of Portugal when they arrived in Brazil. Also in the mid 19th century, romantics celebrated their nation tropical landscape as a symbol of Brazil's distinctiveness in relation to Europe. Uh, there was also the theory of lusotropicalism, developed by Gilberto Freire in the 40s, that exalted the Portuguese colonial enterprise in the tropics. So as you can see, this idea of being tropical, uh, these official representations of Brazil, since they were artistic movement, official letters, and academic theories, they were always developed in relation to the colonizer. There was always the comparison with the colonizer. There was always trying to get Brazil as close as possible to the colonizers and so on. So these representations provided for these people ample material for ironic appropriation and subversion. Uh, according to Caetano Veloso, one of the main uh, singers from, our, from this movement, the idea of cultural cannibalism fit us, the tropicalists, like a glove. We are eating the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix. So like Oswald, the tropicalists, they revisited the question of national formation, but they also used allegory to represent and to criticize the regression to the military authoritar authoritarianism in Brazil. The allegorical mode was not a constant, of course, in the tropicalist songs, but they surfaced here and there, addressing uh, matters of urban experience, political violence, and geopolitical position of Brazil. So just like the modernists, the tropicalists, they were concerned with the theory of translation that was historically and politically relevant. That this translation has to be done bearing that, because that's how, who we are. So in the same year of the 1967, which is when the, the march against the electric guitar happened, uh, there was also one edition of the 19, it was the 1967 Festival of the Song, how is it called, which was like a big thing in Brazil. It's pretty much like people here in Europe, they have like these festivals before Eurovision that everyone watches. So this was also what was going on in Brazil, even though obviously we didn't have Eurovision. Uh, but uh, those festivals, they were like representing pretty much the traditional middle class of Brazilians. They were well dressed. Uh, they were uh, the people that were performing and the people that were consuming those festivals. They were the cultural and intellectual elite, mostly from Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. So bearing this sort of, of, of interesting, of course, there were very there were many singers that were already making nice experimentations and making like uh, political statements as, as long as they could due to the dictatorship, like Chico Buarque in this picture. But nevertheless, it is still has this sort of very traditional and conservative character in the society. So in that year of 1967, Caetano Veloso arrived there wearing a very cheap suit and an orange turtleneck that we cannot see because all the pictures that we have are black and white. And Gilberto Gil also had a song singing there together with the Mutantes as a, as a back band. And they were also dressed up with things that they bought like for, I don't know, two euros on a secondhand shop, not giving any Fs to the, to the dress code of the situation. And Caetano Veloso was even bolder because his backup band, he brought an Argentinian backup brand, not a Brazilian one. So uh, this festival is like a tombstone when it comes to the way that Brazilian culture changed, especially in the political situation that we were living. 
And if you guys manage to find this documentary in English online, it would be amazing because it's a very nice documentary, but I only managed to find it in Portuguese that talks about the importance of this edition of the festival, especially because of the participation of Caetano Veloso and Gilberto Gil. And if you find that in English, please send this to me because I want to show this to my boyfriend. Uh, nevertheless, the song that uh, Gilberto Gil was presenting in this uh, festival is called Domingo no Parque, which literally means Sunday at the park. He was singing that with Gilberto Gil with, with uh, Os Mutantes. Of course, there was also the song of Caetano Veloso, but I'm only going to focus uh, on this one. And it's very interesting because this song was it's a very experimental song that was presented there, but it, uh, it didn't win the festival. It was on the second place. But in this documentary that I just mentioned that uh, I hope you guys can find that in English, uh, people that were in the jury at the time, they all regret not giving the first place to the song. It, and they say that it was because it was so innovative and it was so novel for the Brazilian context that they kind of didn't understand what was going on. They knew it was good, but they were very confusing. Uh, so this song, Domingo no Parque, uh, it has this innocent title, right? Sunday at the park, but it's actually a song about murder. So there is a break of expectation in thematics, which pretty much relates to the Brazilian <laughs> daily life. <laughs> and um, this song also presents a mix of typical Brazilian instruments, like for example, the typical instrument for capoeira, which is the berimbau, with electric guitars and orchestra. But in the way that the, the, the musicalization of the song was constructed, the electric guitars and the orchestra, they are actually trying to, to, to be submitted to the musical order of the berimbau and not the other way around. So the way that the lyrics were constructed, they were pretty much described as uh, being extremely similar to Eisenstein dialectic monta montage theory, as we are going to see soon, so pay attention to that. It's also actually a visual narrative. Visual elements are highly present in the song, but in terms of verse and rhythm. So you can see that there are several different levels of intersemiotic translations going on here in this one song that I'm going to show to you guys. Uh, it works. How do I make this work? Okay. Why can't I show like this? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. This is the typical uh, berimbau uh, rhythm. Jesus, sorry. I was trying to put the volume up. Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is reflected. I hope that you could see what I was talking about. And let's bear, uh, let's keep in mind that this uh, song was presented in national live television during a very strict uh, uh, dictatorship. So it was very shocking at the time. Um, nevertheless, uh, in the next year, uh, in 1968, this core group they got together and they released this album, which, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the writers from the Rolling Stone magazine as well. It's the best Brazilian album ever produced because it's a whole experimental album based on the idea, but experimental in the sense that they were experimenting with popular culture. So it's very accessible, it's very interesting, and it's very novel. And uh, they were very, uh, during the whole album, like all the songs in the album, they were very much concerned with this idea of the anthropophagic translation on it, and also with inter inter-translation in the sense of uh, translating visual to music, to verse, to rhythm, to so on. As we can see from other songs, this is one of my favorite songs from the album, which is called Bach Macumba. Yeah, Macumba is actually to nowadays a pejorative word to talk about uh, Afro-American religious rituals, but we're talking about the 60s, uh, so it wasn't back then. And uh, they start talking about Bach Macumba, which pretty much means like hit the Macumba, Ye Ye, a reference to the Beatles, and they keep working on this idea of Bach Macumba until it becomes Batman. Uh, and the song itself mixes United States rock music with typical Afro-American uh, rhythms. And it's also a piece of concrete poetry, as you can see here by the lyrics being highly visual. Uh, I just want you to play a little bit of the song so that you can uh, listen to it. The Tropicale movement, sadly, was a very short movement in terms of being proto-organized, as I was saying. Uh, some of the members, uh, of, like for example, Tofato Neto, he committed suicide mostly, uh, and there was also the, the whole political situation going on. Some kept working on their personal projects, and some of them were exiled from outside Brazil, like uh, Gilberto Gil and Caetano Veloso that were sent to England. So, of course, the movement couldn't keep going on like that since they didn't have Skype or Zoom to talk among themselves. Uh, but we can say that by undermining the prevailing notions of authenticity, the movement upped up new directions in popular music and ushered in different countercultural practices that were in dialogue with related phenomena in the international sphere. In doing so, the Tropicalia helped to define the cultural and political imperatives of a generation that came of age in sober times and of those ones who followed. And all of that was due to a radical approach of transcreation based on anthropophagic ideals. 
and everything, uh, in, not everything, but like a very important part of uh, and most relevant part of the Brazilian production that was done after that, it's somehow very much related to what those people allowed to us and what this semiotic theory of transcreation allows us to construct and understand our cultural, political and social situations in terms of a semiotic process. Uh, some of the resources that you guys can, uh, I'm sorry, that you guys can find uh, online in English, because of course a lot of this material is in Portuguese. There is this website, I don't know how the English version is, but the Portuguese one is super, uh, which is the Tropicalia uh, website here. There is also a documentary that was released in 2012 about the Tropicalia. There is the book that was written in English by Christopher Dunn called Brutality Garden. Uh, I would very much recommend this article from Marodic Campus called The Rule of Anthropophagy, Europe under the Sign of the Aberration. Well, he talks about anthropophagic movement. Uh, also, if you want to take a look at the online diction of intercultural philosophy, the verbatim about anthropology is very nice. Uh, in English, I could also find uh, an article from Lucy Santayala talking about Percy's reception in Brazil that I was talking in the beginning of the presentation. And right now, there are sessions from the University of Sao Paulo on YouTube about semiotics in Latin America as well. So if you guys want to watch that, it's in Portuguese and Spanish, but it's still very nice. So let's finish by saying that, yes, we have bananas, but we also have semiotics in Brazil. Thank you very much. Okay, now it's the inception. Do I keep the inception? <laughs> okay. So? Yeah, no. Uh, we are waiting for your questions. So whatever you want to ask to Leticia, yes. either uh, what does she think of Chico Barker? <laughs> <laughs> If I may speak, um, yeah. if, if if right uh, if the questions write down because I'm listening some some something coming on, but I cannot understand. Other people writing, but also if you guys here want to say something, or ask something. people in the room, so we have. Any questions? Comments? I'm curious about the pink and animals. About what? Ah, pink and animals. Yeah. You can tailor it in and go back to the slide. I've always wondered why birds are so popular. Yeah. And where did they learn about birds? Where did they learn about birds? How did they disseminate the idea of birds? Successfully popularized birds? Or what else were they into? Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, they were they were mainly uh, Rodri Campos is mainly a translator. He's like the most famous Brazilian translator that we have. And then Pinatari, he worked more with design and architecture as well. But uh, both of them, they kind of became a very famous in Brazil because uh, they were uh, concrete. They were related to the concrete poetry uh, movement. Uh, uh, Rodri Campos' brother, Augusto de Campos, is like one of the main names of concrete poetry. They were actually brothers. And uh, we call it the Campus Brothers, and they were. Uh... Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is also something that I was already talking to you guys uh, about this. That uh, usually uh, in Brazil, if you know someone from a communication department, it's very likely. It's not of course all the time, but it's very likely that if you mention semiotics, this person is going to say, "Oh, first." And not Saussure, and not Grima, <laughs> which is not uh, which is not very usual. Usually, you have people working more with person like uh, science of mind uh, and cognitive uh, approaches and biosemiotics and so on. The people from arts, poetry, literature, communication. Why do we do that in Brazil? It's very much because those guys were the ones behind it. Uh, and also, the people from Tropicalia movement. Uh, one of the guys that I mentioned being part of the core group, Tom Zek. He has a very nice series of videos on YouTube. I don't know if they have English subtitles where he just talks about music. Like he's the kind of guy that you can just sit there, talk for an hour and I would just listen because he's so entertaining. And then he's talking about like uh, what were the, the ideas that were converging in the Tropicalia core group. And he mentions first, he said, oh, there was the semiotics of Charles Saunders first. And this was pretty much because of the relation with the concrete poets. Because those groups are in Rio and Sao Paulo, they were becoming very much connected, especially in the city of Sao Paulo. 
So that's why first is that big thing in Brazil. <laughs> One of the reasons, of course, but a very important reason. Oi? I, I cannot put in the No, the Lord name. Manini? No, I don't know this name. Yes. I think, I think I he's not Brazilian. I don't think he's Brazilian. Um, okay, there is a question. Is there any more or less direct links to the colonization uh, tradition in South America? The accents of these movements concentrate on translation, which the colonization theories don't really accentuate on, but they rather concentrate on political economical factors. So tropicalia and anthropophagy seems like post-colonialism in the colonialization environment. Well, since they were coming from, I think it's all a matter of perspective, right? Especially when we talk about social forces and hierarchical forces, it's like the whole idea of, I don't know, cultural appropriation or so on. We have to have pretty much clear who are the people making the appropriation and who are the people being appropriated, right? It's imagine that there is like a, a pyramid of hierarchy that you can put, I don't know, gender power, ethnicity powers, or in this case, colonization powers. If the, the people that are on top, which are the colonizers, they come and try to appropriate something from the people that are in the bottom, that, yes, is a process of colonization. But if are the people on the bottom doing that actually in their own culture, related to the culture that it's being pushed top bottom onto them, then it's not colonization, it's subversion and appropriation. It's a, it's a source of uh, political resistance, right? Because the movement is going upside down. So in order to stop that, you have to start going bottom up as well. So uh, that's, uh, that's why it's not post-colonialism in decolonization because there is no colonization going on. We are getting, we are simply working on the basis of what is being forced uh, to us. I hope it answered the question. Uh, do you, what do you think will be the effect of the Bolsonaro era on semiotic studies in Brazil? Well, I think it's going to be very interesting, especially because the Bolsonaro era right now, it has also still a very close connection with the United States politics. Like he was, he basically adores Trump. We will call it like the tropical Trump, which goes back to those relations of descriptions of, uh, of uh, tropicalism in relation to the colonizer. And uh, Bolsonaro, the Bolsonaro era uses a lot of, uh, of uh, media resources like Facebook and so on. Uh, so it's something that it's changing a lot in the way that Brazilian, Brazilian people communicate to each other in terms of culture, in, ter in terms of uh, politics. How do you communicate in terms of politics? How do you communicate in terms of culture? How do you produce culture? So it's been it, it, a, a very big change has been happening lately in the cultural and political scenario in Brazil due to that. And uh, of course, uh, the semiotic studies on that can help us a lot of, uh, on understanding what are the mechanisms behind that. But uh, that's it, I guess. <laughs> Any more questions? I think there is one more question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, I completely agree, poor dude. <laughs> I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ah, Daniel? Was trying to write. Ah, Daniel is writing. Yeah. Where is it? No, no, no. Oh, it went out. Okay. Oh, yeah, he's typing. But uh, in the meantime, so there is this very iconic song. Uh, the construction. A construction, yes. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So, uh, can you tell us about From Chico Buarque. Yeah, Chico Buarque was also a very important uh, Brazilian uh, musician. He is the son of one of our main, of our main sociologists and anthropologists uh, in Brazil. And uh, of course, he's from this very high cultural and, and like social elite from Brazil. But he is probably one of our most uh, brilliant composers. And uh, he was also very, very, um, very participative when it comes to being a resistance to our dictatorship and to our politics at the times. And many of the songs that he sings are also songs of resistance 
but uh, always working with the play of words and how not to be caught by the censorship. Like we have this very interesting song from him and Milton Nascimento as well, that it's called Calice. Calice in Portuguese can mean either like the, the a grail, like the Holy Grail, but it can also be the imperative of shut up. So when he says that, he, you don't know that if he's like telling that people are like, like shut up or if he's just talking about something religious. So there were lots of plays of words like that. So uh, there is the, the, um, the Construção song is one of those examples. It's about the alienation in, uh, in everyday life. But he was in contact with the tropicalists. He was friends with the tropicalists. In that document from 67, uh, from the, the festival in 67, where he's wearing like all these gala shirts, he, he gives a, 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 he talks in this, uh, in this documentary saying that when he saw Caetano Veloso and Gilberto Gil arriving, he was like, oh damn, they didn't tell me like, you know, I look like a <laughs> mama's boy here and that's not who I am while they are looking all cool. So they had like this contact, with these, these, these things with each other, but he was never part of the Tropicale movement itself. He was more from like the Tropicale movement at the time was not very much uh, well seen by the cultural elite as she was, it was more literate, so to say. So um, Daniel wrote, uh, have you looked into Neo Tropicalia, how it relates to the original movement aesthetics? I looked very briefly about it. Uh, when I was uh, writing about it, like in my bachelor, I was mostly focusing into the developments of Tropicalia in the Mango Beat movement in the Northeast Brazil, especially with, uh, with uh, Chico Science and Asson Zubi, because they are a movement, uh, a, a, a musical movement as well, that happened uh, in Brazil, especially in the, uh, mostly in the 90s in the Northeast that were pretty much doing what the tropicalists were doing in terms of rock and roll, but with hip hop, with funk, and with, uh, with rap music. So it's also a kind of development of the tropicalist movement. That's usually why, what I use as uh, an example. But send me later about the new tropicale movement because I want to, to know about it. Send it, send for me, please. <laughs> Yeah, very good. I think that's so, it. Thank you very much for everyone watching. And you have my my email. Uh, you can just write in the in the um, in the Facebook book group and something. If you have any questions, if you want the slides as well, I can just make it available and send it to you. Thank you very much. So, thank bye. You. <laughs> um, so.